can go wrong in an instant. A world of betrayal. A world of pain. When your web app is no longer your own. Can you hear me? It's been 48 hours since we lost control of the site. I haven't slept and my cats have started giving me advice. A team of developers will be stretched to the limit. I've never seen an attack like this. It's huge. Do you think it'd be easier to just get new jobs than deal with this? Yeah, let's get tacos. Coming soon, World of The Incident. I'm the person who gets on a call when there's an incident. And on that call, it's most likely your boss, maybe some board members, maybe some people from your legal counsel. And what I say is, I see this all the time. It's gonna be okay. Let's get started. So the reason I'm on that call is I run a service called Expedited WAF. WAF stands for Web Application Firewall. And we mostly work inside cloud environments, mostly on Heroku and mostly larger enterprise type sites. But before we get into like the details of a web application firewall, I really want to talk about the people we're trying to protect your sites against. And those are threat actors. We're in Hollywood. These are not actors, actors. <laughs> These are the polite way of saying hackers. Um, hackers gets used in a lot of different ways. So we renamed the variable to threat actors and now serious security people say threat actors instead. So now you're all serious security people. And this is the number one tool of threat actors, which is resources. I always try to think in terms of what it is they're trying to do and how we can overcome that. So it's very easy to get lost in all the technical aspects of this. And really it's a resource thing. And so money is the big thing they use as a resource. I don't know about yourself. And quick side note, I took this uh, image from the treasury site and it's got a lot of cool, weird security features in it. So you can't print off your own. So what is it that threat actors are buying? They are buying proxy servers. So they run scripts that work through a proxy that attacks your rail server. Now, Proxy is one of those terms like database. Like there's lots of different things that do something similar. It's important to keep them straight because we're gonna be a little bit confusing otherwise. This is a forward proxy. You know what a proxy is a forward proxy is if you're making a request and you know you're using it versus a reverse proxy where it's invisible to you. Further, these, the term for this is anonymous proxy. And what exactly is that? It is this. This is a real list of proxy servers. You could take this list, any one of these IPs, plug it in and use it. Now, a question, who here does not have kids? Anybody? A couple people? I'm gonna let you in on a secret, which is that kids want more than anything in the world to download the sketchiest, <laughs> weirdest mobile applications to every device you own. <laughs> the, the laughter confirms it. and. The way those are monetized quite often, especially in the Android ecosystem, is that they actually have a proxy built into them. Those are then harvested, resold, and they end up in a list like this. Same, your parents go home at Thanksgiving, it's coming up, you gotta do tech support. <laughs> Their machines use as proxies. Servers get compromised. Even a lot of times, web extensions get compromised. So that's where proxies come from. All right, so, we have proxies, we have a script, we're a threat actor. Now we need a botnet. So what I wanna show you is an actual botnet and we're gonna write it right now. So pay attention, but be responsible. Uh, <laughs> this is a botnet. So this is curl, curl's uh, Unix utility, ships on your Mac that we're all using. <laughs> and the dash X says, hey, use this proxy. This is the IP address and port from the first one in the list from the other slide. And if we just swap that out over and over again and made requests over and over again, we could take out a site that would look like it's a worldwide attack. Now, we're Rubyists, most of us, I think. So this is what that looks like in Ruby. And this is a slightly more sophisticated one where we have an array, we're attacking a URL, 
This is a little pseudocody and I used HTTP RV for it, but whatever HTTP library you like, they all support proxies. Now, if you were thinking, oh, this is a global botnet, this is very cool. There's a sense of like crude sophistication <laughs> with all of these. Uh, and by that, I mean, this is not something that you're dealing with an evil genius in most cases. This is something that they're trying to hit a bunch of sites the dumbest way they can to figure out who has been the laziest in terms of protecting them. And that's really what lets them get into things. All right, so now that we talked about threat actors, let's talk about the other side of this, which is web application firewalls. This is a term just like proxy or database. This is a category of software services. I run one, but there's others. And as a developer, if you do not know what a web application firewall was before coming in here, you are not alone. A majority of developers I know don't really think about it, that it's not something that's part of their stack. It's not something that they use or interact with or think about. So in most cases, we have Chrome and we have a Rails server. They talk to each other. Seems straightforward. The WAF sits in between these, and it actually is where your SSL connections are terminated and what Chrome talks to. And then on the back end, it takes that and then talks to your actual application server. So it's one step removed from how the requests normally go. Now, here we're adding in the bits from before. So this is a script from a threat actor interacting through proxies that are hitting a WAF. And now the WAF is making decisions. And that's all a WAF is. It's a rules engine that's applied to incoming traffic. We're in LA, there's a lot of clubs. Imagine there's a club, someone walks up to it and the bouncer says to them, hey, no mesh, no mesh tank tops. <laughs> so maybe that person responds, do you know who my dad is? <laughs> like this, this mesh tank top, it costs more than your salary for a week, but it doesn't matter because they have a rule. So we similarly have rules in a WAF and one of the most basic rules is who gets in and who gets out. So you can imagine a situation where, you know, like you're an IP address and I say, you cannot come in. No offense. So, <laughs> and then on this side, we have someone else who's an IP address. We say, you're on the VIP list. You can certainly come in, but nobody else can. And that is really my definition of a WAF. If you do not have the ability to go and type an IP address in and block someone from accessing your site, it's not a WAF. I mentioned that because there's a lot of like WAF-like services and other proxies and things, but that's really what it comes down to. Now, thousands of customers, a lot of empirical information around what attack senses get, what those look like, all sorts of things that are very valuable to share. But there's two problems. The first of which is that everybody wants to know what happened to everybody else, and nobody wants to share what happened to them. <laughs> this is a real problem because it means we can't learn from all of these things. And it's not that people are like, cowardly or afraid, but there's a lot of weirdness around security incidents. In particular, there's a lot of untested legal exposure. Just quick question, who's here from uh, the EU? Anybody? Couple people hiding somewhere, so. <laughs> In the EU, they have the GDPR, which is a strict set of data security regulations that say like all sorts of things you're supposed to do, or at least achieve. In the US, who is here from a US state? Anybody? Everybody. Do you know the number of emails involved in a data breach that means you need to contact your state's attorney general? Nobody? There's actual laws in about half the US states that have something very similar to that and lots and lots of other stuff. So people are worried about having that, more vulnerabilities, more disclosures, lots of issues. So my solution to that is we're gonna do based on a true story. So these case studies I'm about to show are real. So the names and countries and industries, maybe not, <laughs> but the actual attack details have actually happened and it's something that I've helped people out with. So these are incidents. Now, incidents are what came from the video in the beginning. There are things that take your site down to the point that there's calls and people are upset and all sorts of things. And I'm gonna break these up, again, trying to work the resources from the ones that occur the least to the ones that I see the most. And so the first is distributed denial of service attack, which is the proxies that the threat actors are using. And it has demands. These are actually really rare. I think that's interesting because when I talk to most people, this is what they think of first. They think someone bad is gonna come and try to extort me for something. 
And that is what happened to Bull Capital. The fine people who have a financial services company that does really aggressive like AI investing kind of stuff. And one evening, Denmark time, threat actors came into their Discord and they said, we would like a thousand Monero, please. Uh, you may not be familiar with Monero. It is an untraceable crypto. And it was recently used to trace a trader at the NSA. So your mileage may vary with that. <laughs> but, um, a thousand Monero is uh, a million Danish krone, kroner, can't pronounce that properly, uh, or 150,000 US dollars, roughly. Um, their site was down for about 24 hours and got on a video call with them. The founder of the company was chain smoking and in the midst of his Copenhagen loft in the smoke, his hand was shaking and saying, we must, we must get the site back online. And he was about ready to pay, said, okay, looked him in the eye as much as you can across Zoom and said, I see this all the time. <laughs> it's gonna be okay, <laughs> let's get to work. And we did. And the first thing we did was nothing technical. We talked about his business. And starting from that point, we found all his customers were from the EU, how his advertising worked, how all the pieces came together. And we made a plan, went into some geo-blocking, some other things, and we stopped the attack. Now. That may sound underwhelming, especially from a technical sense. And that is because in this particular case, the WAF is the perfect thing to, to fix this stuff. In the same way that like you're trying to store information long-term, you use a database. If someone came up to you and said like, yeah, I've got a RAM drive that's on a USB stick and I stick it in the laptop, you'd be like, you're a crazy person. That is not how you do this. Similar thing here. Okay, so the next category, distributed denial of service attacks with no demands. Now, these are a lot more varied. This happens quite often in like weird circumstances. So we'll go through a couple different scenarios here. So this was a therapy as a service site and they were hit with the largest DDoS attack that I have ever seen. Uh, it was over a billion requests a day. Their site was down for over 72 hours and it was a very dicey situation. It was dicey because they're a therapist that founded it. They're not technical people. And then they had contract developers and the owners did not understand why the developers would let this situation occur. So to give them some perspective on this very tense call, I did a breakdown that was pretty much like this, which is that a billion requests a day works its way down to about nearly 12,000 attacks a second. That is a lot to handle. And it's not that Rails is slow or can't handle these things, but that the infrastructure needed for this kind of stuff, if you're actually trying to build it up to sustain it, is more than what you have. It's not just more of what you have in place, it's an entirely different set of infrastructure. It's not, you need least bandwidth, you need database connections, you need all sorts of other things you don't have in place. And most importantly, even if you had the perfect plan in place to go from 100 requests a second, to 11,500 requests a second, during an attack, you can't. You can't because the attack is so large and consumes so much resources, you can't get an SSH connection. You can't SSH to your servers. You can't deploy. You can't find logs to stuff because everything is breaking down because literally it's dropping packets. So your SSH request doesn't go through. Nothing works. So you can't even make changes to your environment. All right. so. Let's look at what these requests look like. So to try to complicate things, the attacker wanted to defeat any caching that was going on. So they used a hash function. Uh, if you're not familiar with hash functions, this is MD5, which is an older one, but you put a value in and you get a consistently sized value out that is very hard to reverse engineer. You can't take this top value of like C4CA4238 and turn that back into one in any reasonable way. Okay. so. Then they made a billion requests that look like this, HTTP GET request. Now, broke any possible caching, and these are 404ing. Now, 404ing, not found, it's still taking up a bunch of resources. It still has to be SSL terminated. It's still running through your routes file. Routes and rails can get freaky. You can do any sort of execution on it. And because it's not found, it's running through your whole routes file for every request. Then you have to do string parsing and concatenation to get a page that under normal circumstances would say like, oh, hey, it looks like you're looking for slash nine E D two E eight. That's not found. And finally you get a response HTML, which takes bandwidth. Now 
Here's the sophisticated and unsophisticated part of this, which is that I just explained this whole hash thing. It seems very complicated. Why are they doing this? Does anybody know another set of values from one to a billion that are unique? Literally the number is one to a billion. <laughs> They could have just done this, would have had the exact same results. Again, crude sophistication happening here. And how we stopped this was, you know, Rails, most of your routes, you know what they are. They're the resource routes. You have products, you have users. So we whitelisted all the real routes and let everything else get kicked out and we're able to bring them back online. Now, a couple of takeaways. They never found out who did this, whether it was a disgruntled ex-employee, whether it was a customer, just very odd, never had a ransom demand. And something else to imagine is that they weren't sure if they would actually know if they had a ransom demand. Imagine your support team, they get an email that comes from a throwaway Gmail account talking about Monero, talking about a DDoS attack. Would they even know what that means? It's hard to tell. All right, so next case, the Irene brand candy and confectionery. <laughs> so they're a massive candy wholesaler and they had an API that was pushed out to a lot of mobile clients uh, for commerce and they had no rate limits on the API. And the reason for that was that they did not want to stop anyone from shoveling money at them as fast as possible, which makes sense. But one of their customers pushed a really bad update, which was like a loop in a loop. And that one customer suddenly started making a hundred times more requests than all their other customers combined. Very bad. Lots of people are upset, they're losing money. So they made a rough decision, which is it's an API, they all had API keys, they revoked that API key. So now they've replaced fairly fast queries, which are like, hey, give me all the attributes associated with product ID one, two, three, four with re-authentication attempts. Re-authentication attempts are deliberately slow. Uh, it's from a B-crypt kind of stuff. They're slow to stop like timing attacks and other security things. So that's bad. But also these are all mobile apps. So what happens to mobile apps that are on flaky connections? They retry themselves again and again and again. So they went from a hundred times more traffic than the rest to a thousand times more traffic than the rest. And that's when I got on a call with them and said, yeah, I see this all the time. <laughs> so, um, so did that, we were able to fix things for them. Credential stuffing attacks. This is by far the most common reason I see sites go offline, which is kind of weird because it's not deliberate. This is something that we see used all the time for any site. Maybe it's they want to do fraud of some kind, anything with money. Maybe that's spam emails they're trying to get out, any kind of resources. Or a lot of times it seems like there's nothing involved. What they're actually doing is they've gotten a list of email addresses and passwords from some other data breach and they're essentially testing it for cleanliness to see like, oh, are these still active? Is this something that's happening? So brings us to the National Sports League. The National Sports League, <laughs> had pay-per-views. So I don't know, anyone buys pay-per-views? Is anybody who does, which doesn't seem like the right crowd for it, uh, <laughs> happy with the price of them? And the answer is gonna be no. People hate how much pay-per-views cost. They think the price is too high and there's sort of a, a grudge pricing aspect to it. But pay-per-views are bought online. And the interesting thing is they typically aren't like, you put a credit card in, what happens is you put in the credentials of your cable provider, into there, it does this whole backend reconciliation, and then you get the cost on your next cable bill. Well, that makes them a huge vector for fraud because they aren't directly interacting with credit cards, so so many of the protections aren't there. So National Sports League had literally millions and millions of attempts trying to break into these, because as soon as the attackers were able to crack one, they could turn around and sell it for a couple bucks, and they were making tons of money. So. This is what the traffic looked like. Red is attackers and then blue is legitimate. So this is bad on both fronts. Certainly they don't want all these attackers, but also the attackers are hitting them so hard, it's pushing out the legitimate users. So nobody's happy. Now, pay-per-views are very time sensitive. They have to be sold before the event happens and they're no good afterwards. So they're National Sports League. They're in the cloud. They already have a massive infrastructure. And so they just threw more resources at this. Double, triple the service. And the instinct is right, which is like sight down, Hulk must fix sight, just like going for it. But you see on the right here, 
all they really did was enable their attackers to make even more money because that's where the extra resources were going. And the number of legitimate attacks stayed the same. The instinct's right, but the application is wrong. You cannot infrastructure your way out of these attacks because it only makes it worse. So they realized that and they said, what we're gonna do is we're gonna do rate limiting. Now, they started at two attempts per hour. So if someone's logging in, they mess it up twice, they're, they're blocked, they can't log in again for some period of time. And on the Zoom call, you could hear in the distance almost like the support team just start crying <laughs> because so many legitimate users were being locked out. And so support cases went way up. So I said, okay, this isn't gonna work. And they switched it to five attempts an hour, which is pretty generous in the scheme of things. Now, a thousand proxies, five attempts an hour, 5,000 times 24, 120,000 attempts a day. I'm gonna put out there, it's a career limiting move that if your CEO says, oh, we have to stop this attack, and you're like, fix it, boss. <laughs> we switched it. You can only do 120,000 a day. So it's not something that sits well with non-technical people because it sounds ludicrous, and it is. And then also, it's not something that sat well with the threat actors. And you know what they did? They hit back and spent $5. <laughs> spent $5, bought roughly another couple thousand good proxies, at which point I spoke to them. I see it all the time. Got on a call with them, started going through their logs. And this is what we saw. Does anybody see anything wrong with this user agent? This is what was coming in on the request. It's like three browsers. Yeah, so I can rephrase it that I think would help people, which is, can anyone spot the problem with this user agent if you saw it today in your logs? Yeah, this is old. So this user agent version string is from January of 2022. And this is a very common thing we see, which is that, you know, a lot of times user agents are fake, very easy to fake user agents. But a lot of times like headless Chrome instances that are using these attacks and things, they lag. And since Chrome auto updates, it's not a big deal and to pick these out. And also from the support side, it's very easy to fix. Then if someone calls like calls in and says like, I can't log in because it's giving me this weirder. It's like, just restart your computer. They restart it and they can get back in. So something that worked for them. Now, that was incidents. That was things that take down your site, all of that. So I want to jump back to something. So World War II, that was not a great segue, but we'll just go with it. <laughs> <laughs> Harkening back to World War II, they had planes going out and not so many planes were coming back. And so statisticians, the developers of their day, were brought in to try to see what they could be done with this. And they were shown an image like this, which was, hey, here's the planes we have and here's all the holes. Where should we put the armor? And where should they put the armor? And although like on the right one, they see like all the holes sort of overlapping. Well, they all put it in the wrong spot. <laughs> you have to put the armor where there's no holes, because those are the planes that came back. The planes that come back, all the holes represent is where it doesn't matter if it gets shot. Similarly, I'm trying to tell you, these are all sort of dramatic and cool, these big incidents, but I don't think this is really what people need to worry about. I think what they need to worry about are intrusions. So intrusions are something that happens to 100% of your sites. It's happening right now, it happens constantly. Uh, so these are hidden attacks. They won't take down your site. You probably won't know that they've occurred. And if you do see them in your logs, you may dismiss them. So let's talk about Oliver's comfy and cool meal fashion, which is where I bought this number from. All right, so this is a log line. So the IP address is in yellow. The red is the attack. And we're running Rails. This is something you're quite likely to see in your logs. It's unlikely that this is gonna show up in Google Analytics or Plausible or whatever other JavaScript-based analytics your system you're using because it's a bot, it's trying not to trigger that stuff. But this is literally a botnet that just scanned your site, taking down the operating system, the framework, the host, versions of those. And we see these IP addresses again and again and again. So they don't stop with this, they come back with other things. But if we could, stop this, we'd be in much better shape. Similarly, there's a lot of credential stealing. 
This is also hidden from most people for the same reasons, but this is trying to take anything, all your environment variables, your secrets, build artifacts. And the way that you normally find out about this, oh, we're starting. So this is actual beta. This is a traversal attack. And so this is just looking through all the different, you know, paths within your web application to pull this out. An interesting thing about these is they can even affect static websites. Um, that's sort of almost the classical way these things are leaked, which is that someone makes a marketing site, it's Jekyll or it's Hugo, they accidentally leave the ENV file in there and then it gets pulled. So how do people find out about these? They, it's not taking the site down. They find out about them because they get a massive bill from AWS because people go on, they take your credentials, they mine crypto. I hear Monero's very popular. Um, <laughs> and, you know, they go on their way. It's a resource utilization thing. The other thing that happens is if they can get into your build system because they steal your Git credentials or whatever else, they will inject JavaScript. Not a customer of mine, but Ticketmaster had a massive issue with this where someone, was able to add a one line statement to a JavaScript file in Ticketmaster that was essentially a credit card skimmer. <laughs> and the only reason they found out about it was the bank that was doing the clearing of the transactions said like, all of these are coming from Ticketmaster, informed them, they did an audit and they found, I think if I'm remembering correctly, it was named something like IE6 uh, <laughs> shim, you know, version one, two, three kind of thing. So in the other place, people learn about this stuff is Have I Been Pwned, which is a website that helps with data breaches, a place you don't want to show up if you're a SaaS application. So they leverage these intrusion attempts of all different kinds into a breach, into all sorts of bad things for your site. Now, I want to talk about another exploit that's in this vein that's going to be a little weird. And the reason it's weird is that it's for Java. So there's a log for J vulnerability. I don't know if anyone has seen this string, familiar with this? This string is death. <laughs> so it's weird to talk about this, but this is a dangerous string. So this exploits a vulnerability in log for J, which is a Java logging utility. And every single site on the internet has basically been tested for this. And so what happens is if it's able to be written into the log file of a Java log4j service, it runs out to this IP address and downloads the payload. The payload is a Java class, which gets executed, and then they own your machine. Um, so goal here is let's play a game. Let's play a game if we can get this into your log files. So here I've cleverly added at Gmail to the dangerous string, and I would put this into your email forms. Do, would this make it into your logs? No, maybe? What if did an HTTP get? Now this would 404, would this make it into your logs? Maybe. How about this? We're gonna do curl and we're gonna set the user agent to be the dangerous strain. Easy enough? Now, maybe it made it into your logs, maybe it didn't, but we have Rails SaaS. <laughs> and that's cute, but we're all running Rails apps, so it doesn't really matter, except the ecosystem of SaaS apps is now SaaS apps on top of SaaS apps. So here we have a client, it's interacting with the web server, and that web service, that's your web service, has a bunch of SaaS apps that you use, a logging service, transactional email, content delivery network, and then each of those also has a bunch of SaaS apps they use. So your transactional email service also has a log service and monitoring software and all sorts of things. And if you're in a situation where your transactional email services log service happen to be log for j which is not an unreasonable assumption it runs out to the purple bit gets a malware the log service is compromised and what is the number one use for transactional email that's right password reset and so the attackers would have the password reset url and the email address for all of your customers so this is a new thing when a lot of these services were put together we never really considered this but Security is a community activity. And across all the different frameworks and across all of our different work we're doing, we, we have to think about it that way. So this is our WAF toolkit. These are all the things that a WAF provides, blocking by geography, but all these different things. Now, a problem, none of this is in Rails. None of this comes by default. It's all something you have to add in separate. And most of the people that use this, they're thinking we're too small to need that. We don't need it. 
And, you know, that's where I see people just get blindsided constantly by. Or, you know, it's a big company and they have a staging server and they're like, ah, oh, we don't really need it. So I think this is due to a brutal resource asymmetry, <laughs> which is that any attacker can trivially write a script. We did it at the beginning of the talk to contact 10,000 websites, throw an exploit into all of them and just see what gets returned or to see whether or not, you know, they happen to have a bad day that day and checked in their credentials. What we don't have is a coherent response to this. And when I say we, I mean literally the people in this room, the people running SaaS applications, we don't have a way to act collectively. There is no tool or service that fits in this gap. We have some existing open source solutions, which a lot of times if you read through them are basically someone being angry at you for not like grepping through your logs aggressively enough. It's not an easy solution. And then on the other side, you have this, the world where I live, which is enterprise WAF options, which are expensive. They're enterprise -y by definition. So how do we change this? How do we shift this around to where security ships in every single app? Well, we need a new kind of WAF. And here at RailSAS, I'm happy to announce that we're making one. It's open source. It's an in-app WAF and it runs on top of Redis. So this is the architecture for it. So this runs inside your application. So there's a WAFRS client that works with Rails and talks to Redis. And then separately, there's an application that talks back to the Redis server that's the admin. So this pulls it out of the context of your main application. So it's very easy to implement. The client is very thin. The rules engine, which is what defines a WAF, is all held in Redis, so it's very fast. And this designed to be just very lightweight and something you can drop in. Something that can do automatic intrusion blocking. So if a .env file happens, you know, to be requested on your site, Rails will just let that be served. We would like that to be stopped. This would stop it. This is also one of those like career limiting moves to explain this to a non-technical person. But yeah, like a giant botnet just scanned us and tried to get our credentials, but we're fine with it because it didn't actually work today. Doesn't sit well. Wafris would block this IP and you'd be going on to itself. The other thing we can do, because we're based on Redis instead of just log files, is we can do real reporting, not logging. And we can do this in real time. So in a normal context, you have a WAF, you have a Rails server, and then you have a log service. And you have to look through the log to see, hey, what were the IP addresses that were coming in? We have to dig through them. I showed some of the logs from before and how we pulled bits out. Well, that billion request DDoS attack that I mentioned, that would have generated right around 500 gigabytes of logs. If you've ever tried to deal with 500 gigabytes of log files, it is not an easy task. So that same amount of information, which is really just the IP addresses, how often they made requests and when they made them, takes about 250 kilobytes inside of Redis because it boils down to just the IP address, an incremental counter. Yeah, so it's a much more efficient use of space. And more than that, it's the actual information you need so that you can then go in. And so this is a real screen from a real version of Wafers we've had live and running for a couple of months. And you can go in, find the IP address. Let me zoom in. Find the IP address, see how many requests it's made, and then one click block it. So by using the built-in Redis data structures, we're able to radically simplify all of this to something that's easily used. Now, I, I think something we've maybe forgotten as a group is that Rails really set the tone for a lot of web framework stuff. All the things like convention over configuration, secure defaults, you know, all the tooling that we love. And my hope is to try to get the same thing to happen for security, for Rails to be a leader in this. <laughs> All right, um, so how are we going to do this? Well, part of this is, you know, leading by example. And again, we think security is a community activity. We need to bring along the other frameworks with us, which is why we're also going to have clients for the other web frameworks. And the Wafris admin application is a Rails app that is still used to administer this. Uh, we have plans and people in place working on these clients for Wafris, in case you're doing any other sort of development or you have friends, and deliberately designing this to be very easy to drop in to any hosting environment. It works, it's designed to work with the lowest common denominator, Redis. So a Redis, maybe it's free, maybe it's single digit dollars a month from your provider, all that, and one last exciting thing, which is that 
Bullet Train, Andrew's open source uh, Ruby on Rails SaaS framework, is going to include it by default. So, very happy about that. All that being said, we still need your help. Myself, Ryan Castillo, who's sitting down here in the front, co-founder, um, we're looking for 10 sites to try this. Like, literally, I'm not putting my email up, address up there. I want you to find me here and tell me you would like to do this. <laughs> now, these don't have to be production sites, but just any site you have that you'd be interested in running Waffers on to try to test it out to help us actually make this happen. We also wanna to talk to anybody who's interested in trying to get the message out of security by default, leading with Rails. And lastly, we just wanna hear your security stories. I've already heard multiple stories when I talked about, hey, here's what I'm giving a talk on. People say, oh yeah, we had the weirdest incident last year where this thing happened. We'd love to hear more of that. And that's where I'll end it. Please help me. <laughs> Thank you so much.